upon us. I haven't even finished eating all my Halloween candy. To start any conversation about Thanksgiving, we need to start with dessert. Google Trends gives us a nice map of all the favorite pies searched state by state. The results are interesting, not only because they make us hungry, but also because I have never heard of several of these before. Florida leads off with its love of key lime pie because it's Florida. The Bible Belt is next with pecan, chocolate, sweet potato, and the famous Mississippi mud pie. Then much of the rest of the country is torn between fruit-based pies and dairy-based. Though oddly, the dairy states lean fruit. Surprisingly, out of the 50 states, only four prefer pumpkin pie. I'd love to know what Frito chili pie is, though, or tamale pie, though Arizona's love of grape pie is entirely foreign to me. I do have one question, though. What is a shoe fly pie? I mean, seriously. What's in it, and why is it named after a song from the Spanish-American War in Yellow Fever? If you know, let me know in the comments. Now, not only are we hungry, but we've learned something about Thanksgiving. Namely, that for all of our national adherence to Thanksgiving as a holiday, we tend to be quite regional or local in our expression of many of our traditions. And that really is the best part of Thanksgiving. Of all the holidays, it is one of the lowest bars of entry. You only have to be hungry, and you have to be willing to be thankful. In fact, to my mind, Thanksgiving is usually the least controversial of all the American holidays. But what is the history of American Thanksgiving? And I am specifically talking about American Thanksgiving. Our friends in Canada will remind us that they have their own Thanksgiving tradition that falls in October. Whatever they eat, I just hope there is poutine. Well, to start with the history, we have to go back to Europe. And the roots actually go back to ancient times in the early church, or at least to the early Middle Ages. You see, the practice of calling for a collective time of feasting and thanksgiving comes from the Bible. The practice in the Bible actually is twofold. Essentially, in times of peril, bad harvest, war, whatever, you would fast and pray. In times of plenty or in times of victory, you held a celebration and you called for general thanksgiving. It was very religious, in other words, even a little bit liturgical. A king or a queen or a local ruler would call for a time of thanksgiving, say, after a larger-than-expected harvest, or after the birth of an heir, or for a royal wedding, or just for the sake of giving thanks in general. It was accompanied historically by a more or less religious obligation to attend some church service, followed by feasting on whatever food was seasonal. These origins in Europe are the seeds of what comes to the New World and actually existed in America before there was America as a country. But I'll tell the story of the first Thanksgiving as we know it in a second, but we should start by pointing out the fact that the first Thanksgiving, at least properly speaking, was not the first Thanksgiving. That is to say, the first Thanksgiving, uppercase T, was preceded by a few other lowercase t Thanksgiving proclamations in the New World. Current research and debate lists at least seven cities in four different states as the possible location of the first official proclamation of a Thanksgiving celebration. The three that often get the most attention and probably have the best claim to being the actual first Thanksgiving are San Elizario in Texas, St. Augustine, Florida, and Berkeley Plantation, or Berkeley 100, in Virginia. Now, I won't labor the point here in great detail, but each of these communities had public proclamations of Thanksgiving before Plymouth Rock was even discovered by settlers. Catholics were in the New World, of course, and they certainly followed the old pattern of fasting in times of want and feasting and giving thanks whenever they were in good times. There were also Huguenots and those in Jamestown that certainly preceded those who landed in Plymouth. I could go on. But suffice it to say, the story of the first Thanksgiving as we remember it, with Puritans in buckled hats, eating with Native Americans, occurred later. And no, that should not make you know-it-alls around the Thanksgiving table when people mention the first Thanksgiving. You certainly don't have to interrupt your child's school play on Thanksgiving and do a, well, actually speech about how people held Thanksgiving feasts in the New World before the pilgrims. <laughs> Please don't be that person. Rather, the point is that when the pilgrims landed in Plymouth, 
the events that unfolded that led to the first Thanksgiving were part of a longer tradition. They were not creating something new at the Plymouth Thanksgiving. It's not like they looked up from the turkey and said, hey, this is nice, let's do this annually. Rather, they were doing something that had been done back in Europe, and it carried on new significance after that. Of course, the first Thanksgiving in Plymouth is monumental in the foundation of our nation's memory of Thanksgiving to this day. Now, I have a video on this channel, an old one at this point, on the Puritans in the New World. I said in that video that too often, the story is told as if the pilgrims coming to the New World were leaving a gulag in England or Europe, and they were coming to invent the very idea of religious freedom in the first place. Well, the truth is always a bit more complicated. Those who claimed to Plymouth had actually had freedom for roughly 10 years in the Dutch city of Leiden. They had left England, to be sure, to protest the liturgical conservatism of the Anglican Church, but the Netherlands had actually welcomed them and given them freedom. The motivation to come to the New World and settle had as much to do with the desire to maintain their English-speaking heritage as anything else. Living in the Netherlands for so long, their children were starting to become second-generation locals. Dutch was becoming not just the new language that they were speaking, but for their kids, it was becoming their primary language. And the family thought it best to risk the perils of settling in the new world in order to preserve their own heritage and to start anew. And as we all know, the landing in Plymouth and the establishment of a colony there was deeply dangerous. Roughly half of those who arrived died in the first year. Only four women survived and 22 men. The other half were teens or children. Now, they were on good relations with the Wampano tribe, whom they met when they landed, though the relationship was always at least a little bit tense. The pilgrims had signed a treaty with the natives, and peace was strong enough to share the first Thanksgiving in 1621. But with only 22 men, the situation could have easily gotten out of hand if the relationship soured. For example, when the Wampano showed up, they arrived with almost double the number of people in total than were on the pilgrim side to begin with. But the relationship was good. The harvest had been enough to warrant a feast, and William Bradford, the governor, called for the celebration as a response to God's provision. The food was said to have been plentiful. In fact, many of the foods at the table that day are those that we associate with Thanksgiving even now. Corn, squash, wild turkey, and the like. And there were even several deer hunted and brought by the Wampano. But there were also local foods that began to come to the New England Thanksgiving, as it would eventually be called codfish, lobster, those types of things. Now, I won't poke too many holes in this story other than to point out that the way that's portrayed is often wrong. The dress of both pilgrims and the Native Americans in modern pop culture is not how they dressed back then. The feathered headdresses we often associate with the Wampano at this meeting was not how they dressed. Those feathered headdresses are typical of the Plains Indians, whom neither the pilgrims nor probably the Wampano even knew existed. The pilgrims, too, did not wear all black and have buckles on their shoes and hats. I still don't know where the buckle on the hat thing came from. I'm not sure what a buckle on a hat would do. Certainly wouldn't serve any advantage. They probably, the pilgrims, wore festive colors, actually, and were not this joyless, judgmental people as we remember them today sometimes. Those stereotypes of pilgrims being so dour is mostly a product of the 20th century, with books like The Scarlet Letter and even recently in the show Wednesday. But that's not what a pilgrim actually was. And so the first Thanksgiving in 1621 was a time of thanksgiving and a time of miracles, really. The fact that they had survived and the fact that they had enough food for the following year to get them through the winter was worthy of thanksgiving. But after this historic first thanksgiving, as we call it, there would be plenty more. In fact, there would be so many I don't have time to even start naming them. Thanksgiving celebrations melded quite easily into the harvest-type festivals that were beginning to sprout up in the New World. But Christians in the colonies would often call for fasting in certain occasions and feasting on other occasions. Those old European traditions don't die. The next time after 1621 that Thanksgiving takes a dramatic leap forward in terms of the identity of our nation was, not surprisingly, right after the birth of our nation in 1776. After the bones of our Constitution and Bill of Rights and other things were laid down, and just as that first Congress was about to end, Representative Elias Boudinot made a motion suddenly to request the new president, George Washington, 
to recommend a day of thanksgiving to the 13 states, thanking especially, he said, Almighty God. This resolution is important because the language and the moment here are significant. Boudinot is an interesting person in his own right. He was a staunch Presbyterian, but an abolitionist and an advocate for women's rights. He was a trustee of the College of New Jersey that would later become Princeton, and he would go on later to serve as the first president of the American Bible Society. His personal views in this resolution for Thanksgiving were entirely traditional. Just as the nation had always called for days of prayerful feasting and thanksgiving, so too he felt they should now as the nation had finally been formed. There were two issues, however, with this resolution, at least two criticisms that were raised by others in the House. First, more than one representative noted that Congress had almost literally just let the ink dry on the separation of church and state. Typical for America, the separation of church and state will both be ironclad and vaguely applied in circumstances such as this. That's not me being cynical, by the way. The American experiment on these issues has always been a subject of debate, precedent, and legal testing of the extent of the separation of religion and politics. So at least a few in the House raised the objection that we just separated church and state, and therefore, any call to Thanksgiving that has a religious overtone is already in violation of the Constitution. That didn't carry much weight because the call for a Thanksgiving celebration was not the establishment of a religion, but rather a calling for a general Thanksgiving. The more vocal issue, however, was not about religion. The founding fathers weren't anti-religious after all. It was on the bigger debate about the new question of the limits of federal power over against state authority. You can remember your civics lessons. This is the point. There will always be debates about federal power versus the power of the state. On this issue, representatives were far more vocal, saying that it is up to the 13 governors of each state to call Thanksgiving in their own jurisdiction. The idea that Congress and the president would call for a Thanksgiving throughout the nation was seen as a bad precedent. Now, here the wording of Boudinot's resolution is important. He does not call for the establishment of a holiday or the ordering of a Thanksgiving throughout the country. He asks that President Washington recommend a day of Thanksgiving. And that is ultimately what happened. The resolution passed the House, then the Senate, and then it ended up in front of Washington. Like most things in his presidency, the way President Washington handled this first Thanksgiving established the pattern for nearly all future presidents. On October 3rd, Washington issued his Thanksgiving proclamation to be held November 26, 1789. He does reference the providence of Almighty God, as every scholar has noticed, but he is purposely vague about what he means. He mentions that God pardons our transgressions, alluding to the Lord's Prayer, but again, he is vague about that. The message was simple. Give thanks to God, and let's have a day of thanksgiving. And his letter was circulated to the state's governors and was pitched by Washington as a request for everyone to join in. Now, since Washington, every president, just about, there are exceptions, but just about every president, has sent some letter of this kind or made some proclamation during the Thanksgiving season. It's certainly been around since Lincoln, as we'll see in a minute. Thomas Jefferson refused to do so when he was president, due mostly to his unwavering commitment to the separation of church and state. On this, he is an outlier. He felt like any representation of religion at all in politics was going to be bad. Most presidents after him, though, mentioned God or the Almighty or some equally Washingtonian appeal to the divine. And I don't mean to be sarcastic. Again, this is just how it's been done since George Washington, in order to make Thanksgiving more ecumenical and more broad for the entire nation. Interestingly enough, the appeal to the pilgrims never really showed up until the 1900s. And since the 1980s, there has been increased reference to Native Americans as being participants in the first Thanksgiving as well. But the message is always the same. God, the Almighty, one greater than ourselves, as George W. Bush put it, should be called upon as we give thanks. In fact, out of all the presidents, only two mentioned Christ or Christianity in their Thanksgiving proclamations. Grover Cleveland in 1896 and McKinley in 1900. And both seem to have done so from their personal faith. Now, from George Washington on, there really was no national holiday. 
What continued was more or less a tradition of calling for Thanksgivings around the same time of year. By and large, these were events held state by state. Not every state got involved, by the way. Virginia very famously did not like Thanksgiving for a long, long time. Some states would hold it in October. Some had it in mid-November. Some had it in late November. It was just kind of a ad hoc fall type event. It wasn't a specifically set day. The other thing about Thanksgiving is it wasn't an American identity either. It wasn't seen, for example, as almost the second 4th of July in the fall. It was seen as just something nice, something a little bit more religious, a little more solemn, that coincided with the fall and the run-up to winter. It was ecumenical, it was broad, and it came and went from time to time. As I said, there were even some presidents that forgot or skipped their Thanksgiving proclamation in the 1800s. So how did it become a national holiday? Well, the answer is one person, Sarah Josepha Hale, is truly the mother of Thanksgiving. Now, Hale is one of the most interesting women you'll ever come across. She really ought to be considered one of the most interesting women in American history. Not only did she write the poem Mary Had a Little Lamb, which we all know, but she was an abolitionist, an early advocate for women's rights, and frankly, one of the top Americana trendsetters in all of American history. Hale started the first daycare for small children. She created the first public playground for children. She's almost single-handedly responsible for introducing the Christmas tree into American culture in the 1850s, but that's a different video. She would go on to be instrumental in the founding of Vassar, and the list goes on and on. Hale was a well-educated woman. She was born in 1788 in New Hampshire, widowed by 34, though, and a mother. The only recourse she had was to become a writer. She published poetry and other things to limited success. And then finally, she had a best-selling novel, an abolitionist novel, called Northwood. That bestseller led to her becoming an editor in Boston of a small magazine for women. Later, an entrepreneur took note of the quality of her work, and he bought that small magazine, and he created something called the Goodies Ladies Book. Horrible name by modern standards for a brand. But the Goodies Ladies Book was, if you took Vogue and Good Housekeeping and maybe one or two other magazines, and blended them together stylistically. That is the goodies ladies' book. You can't overestimate the value of this magazine in early American culture. It focused on what it was like to be American, and Hale championed what she called domestic science, which is the art and practice of taking care of the home, taking care of children, and the domain of the women of the nation, as she saw it. Well, along the way, Hale decided that Thanksgiving, in her mind, was the quintessential American holiday after the 4th of July. And she spent decades writing hundreds, if not thousands, of letters to president after president after president, to senator after senator after senator, calling for them to take Thanksgiving on as an American holiday throughout the nation. She believed it was quintessential. It was the classic American holiday. And her magazine focused heavily on things to do during the Thanksgiving season. In fact, many of the traditions as you and I know them come from this magazine. Now, her letters were largely ignored or rejected. That is, finally, until Abraham Lincoln. Towards the end of the Civil War, just months after Gettysburg, Lincoln finally sided with Hale. You see, Hale had begun to argue that not only is Thanksgiving a quintessentially united holiday for all of America, but, she said... Thanksgiving is a time, after so much bloodshed during the Civil War, when women, and especially mothers, can heal the soul of the nation. And you have to imagine all those soldiers walking home, their bodies broken, emotional damage, all the things that come with war. And Hale continued to argue and to suggest that Thanksgiving is the perfect time when we stop work, we stop caring about our own differences, and we just give thanks in the hospitality of the home with mom and the women overseeing the festivities. And, sure enough, Lincoln agreed. Just four months after Gettysburg, Lincoln issued the first nationwide call for Thanksgiving as we know it today. In fact, since Lincoln, no president has missed that proclamation ever since. Now, it would be some time before it is officially on the books. It takes until 1941 for Congress to make Thanksgiving the actual official day that we know it today. But if it weren't for Hale and all of her tireless effort, 
Thanksgiving would probably still be regional, local, and a matter of the state. Thanks to Hale, it is a time of enormous hospitality, kindness, and Thanksgiving. <laughs>